For those who have been blessed to raise children, every parent have dreams, visions for their children. We all want them to be, you know, uh, responsible, citizen, generous, civic-minded, brilliant at what they do. And we try to facilitate that, you know, with extracurricular activities, you know, just to support, to keep them excited, interested, so that they are focused in doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? So, um, so that's, that's, that's our parental uh, responsibility, we say. And um, Apostle Paul, not Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, we've been talking so much about Paul, you know. Today we are focusing on Apostle Peter. Apostle Peter is saying that, that when we become Christian, when we, when we commit to follow Jesus, uh, followership, discipleship, growing in faith in the knowledge of God, does not automatically happen. It's almost like it's almost like if you want to have a well-toned body, and you are a marathon runner like Steve is up there. Uh, you know, you just you just you just don't dress up and line up to run. If you really want to run, you have to go to gym, and 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 do some some cardio and and build your muscles, right? And repetition is good. You go every day and you do the same thing. And then maybe by next week, you're lifting, you know, not, not you know, 50 pounds, but you're lifting 150 pounds and you feel good. And next week, you're lifting 200 pounds, you know, whatever, you know. So, so, so you, are, you are really, you're, you are making your body to be acclimated and, and you know, the endurance, the stamina, you know, they talk about, you know. Those things just takes time. It takes time. And Peter is saying, it's the same thing when we made a commitment to follow Jesus. We need to do all of these things for us to really have that wonderful faith assurance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just, and, and, you know, coming to church is great. But Sunday morning is not enough. Right? An hour, two hour is really not enough for faith formation to develop a sturdy, strong spirituality. And therefore, and therefore, what you do when you are not in church for your own you know it is about it is about developing some sense of discipline to pray and prayer is not necessarily coming to god to tell him what to do for you right we have a tendency of coming to god to make him run errands for us right God, do this good, you know, do that, you know. If you do that, I'll do this. So, I guess, I guess we, we need a little bit of that, you know. In our, in our Bible study group, we, 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 we talked about, you know, uh, uh, the word acts, right? A is about adoration. C is about confession. T is for thanksgiving. S is for supplication. That's not a bad thing. To have some discipline for you to focus. But 
But meditation, prayer and meditation is good. Meditation is something that, that we Protestants are not very good at. Because we just like to talk to God and walk away. And we feel good, you know. I told God what to do. But meditation is about internalizing and accepting your limitations and still trying to find that foundation on which you can stand. There are so many things in life, no matter how you do, we may not have everything what we need in life. And therefore, how do we find comfort and strength in being who you are? And, and that takes time too. And so Peter is basically saying, yearn for the spiritual milk. You know, yearn for something deeper to ground yourself. You know, David, the psalmist talks about, God lifted me up from miry clay. I grew up in jungles. So I know what miry clay is like. You know, sometimes you're deep in the muck like this, you know. And uh, and David says, and God God pulled me up from the miry clay and set my foot on a rock, on a stone. You know, that means God granted him the solid ground this firm foundation where he could stand. You know. So so we need to find ways to develop our spirituality. Peter is really nudging us to go beyond that and develop a, a, a bigger picture. And 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 Peter is saying that, that Jesus was rejected. Um, he was rejected, humiliated in every way, and yet he did not sin. That's what the scripture says, right? And, and, and this, this uh, rejected guy that Peter talks about, um, somebody had already spoken about the cornerstone. Isaiah was talking about the cornerstone. Let me read what uh, what Isaiah Isaiah said. You just have to wait for me. There we go. So in Isaiah 28 verse 16, Therefore thus says the Lord, See, I am laying in Zion a foundation stone, a tested stone, a precious stone, a sure foundation. Isaiah was talking long before Peter. And of course, Peter is, is taking the thoughts and ideas from Isaiah. That someday, this king Messiah that was humiliated and crucified will become the cornerstone. Hmm. As I was reading that, I found another, another place where it is mentioned. The psalmist, even David talked about it in Psalm 118 verse 22. And it said, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Ah, Scripture was already talking about this powerful, power, powerful image, metaphor about Jesus Christ. Hmm. So, so in order for us to really have a better sense of understanding about 
what cornerstone is. You know, what cornerstone is, what living stone is, what precious stone is. Uh, I had to go and Google it. You know, and, 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 and Google has some wonderful stuff. So here is an article that came out in June 20th, 2019. The title, Architectural Cornerstones, The Meaning, History, and Intent. I'm going to read. Quote. In relation to architecture, a cornerstone is traditionally the first stone laid for a structure. With all other stones laid in reference, in reference to the cornerstone. A cornerstone marks the geographical location by orienting a building in a specific direction. I like that. Cornerstones have been around millennia in some shape or form. In ancient Egyptian and Mesopotamian culture, the equivalent of a ground-breaking ceremony was foundation ritual, which followed the gods to protect a building. Foundation deposits, they would, they would dig the foundation, put the thing, and then they would put some certain sacrifices, rituals that will be done uh, to bless uh, the foundation. Uh, so, so that is that. Um, then I found another one. The cornerstone or foundation stone or setting stone is the first stone set in the construction of a masonry foundation. All other stones will be set in reference to this stone, thus determining the position of the entire structure. Deeply grounded, solid foundation is able to hold all the other structural arms of the building. It is the reference point for a well-built house. End of quote. Huh? This is what prophet was saying about Jesus. He will be the foundation stone, the cornerstone, living stone. I got carried away and I read another article. And this one, he says, the stone arch bridges. Quote, the foundation of a stone arch bridge are the single most important factor in determining the life of the bridge. If the foundations are good, the bridge can last for centuries. Even millennium, it says. So, Peter is saying, Christ, through all this journey that we went through, through the land, the Holy Week, and then Easter. He is saying, he charted this path, rejected, but he became a cornerstone, and, and, and through him, we are able to build our lives. Whatever arms do you want to put in your life, whether your professional life, the social life, the political life, and whatever life you have, as long as you are, you are aligned with the foundation, you will have truthful life, kind of. You know. The stability will be part of your story because the foundation is holding you. Isn't that nice? Don't we all want a good foundation for our lives? Good foundation for our church and ministry? Good foundation for our children and grandchildren? You know, 
it is not just the business degree, but it is always good to have faith integrated. Right? You know, if we are able to integrate those two, I think we will be brilliant. Not brilliant up here, brilliant in the heart. Right? Uh, you know, I uh, sometimes wonder why Christians go against each other. Because what is happening in Manipur, some of those people are Baptists at different locations. You know? They are probably from the same council. And yet, how can they master their mind or entertain the idea about going out and torching somebody's house or torching a whole village? I heard an interview this morning before coming to church. She was in the middle she had she lived in Delhi, went home to see her parents, and then this got started. But she was supposed to return back to Delhi, so she was able to leave. But her sister is seven months pregnant, pregnant, and she doesn't know where her brother is. You see, and and hundreds and thousands of people are camped in one building. You know, they are all sleeping like sardines, you know. And uh, imagine trying to keep children settled in that kind of situation. Um, do they have Christ as their cornerstone? Because I was working on the sermon and I'm reading this and I go, wow, man, this is terrible. Can we, as people, regardless of our ethnicity or our cultural diversity or even political diversity, can we, as people of faith, find a common ground as Christ as our foundation? You know, and, and let the standard Help us to understand each other despite uh, all our differences. When I was in Orange County, oh, time is gone. When I was, this is the last one. When I was in Orange County, I was part of interfaith organization. And in that interfaith organization, we also had interfaith high school group. High school group, we had Buddhists, Mormons, Jews, um, Sikh, and uh, Christians, and all high schoolers. And one of our, one of our, uh, ground um, of order was we will, when we are together we will not talk about our differences. We will only talk about what we agree and build on that. And so when we go to Jewish temple we all become Jew and we listen to rabbi what the rabbi has to say and then if it's a ritual Sunday of a Jewish tradition of Sukkot in the book of Exodus the synagogue have built this temporary synagogue and we all go through it and we talk about the beauty the element of sacredness in the Sukkot journey and then we eat Jewish food and then one month 
we go to uh, Anaheim uh, Mosque. And that day we are all Muslim. I mean, not believer, but, but our, our togetherness, right? And so we walk with the Imam, and Imam tells stories about this and that. And that day we eat Muslim food. And then we, one day we come to Buddhist temple in Yorba Linda. And the pastor there is a Canadian, and she is an ordained Buddhist scholar. Um, and the temple was established by a woman. Ooh, yes. And that day we become Buddhist, and then she tells stories about Buddhism. And that day, we eat whatever they cook. We spent two, three hours together doing some great stuff. And if this interfaith group that can be fighting tooth and nail with each other can find a home where they can understand each other, why can't we as Christians do that? You know? Why can't we lay down whatever is irking you and try to make something beautiful because Christ is our cornerstone if Christ is the cornerstone whatever you lay built around you will be beautiful I think that is what Peter is getting at can you do that and I think we can. You know, we can. Because we are called to be people of hope. We are called to be holy. We are called to pursue righteousness. We are called to love one another. We are called to care for one another. If that is the foundational theology of Christ's teaching, what more do we need? Think about it. So, there ends my sermon.